morning and welcome to House to Home Live, your weekly resource for everything real estate and beyond. We're here at the beautiful Five Ponds Golf Club in Warminster, Pennsylvania, and we have a fantastic show lined up for you today. We are talking about how to market your home, and we have two very special guests. Get more organized, Maureen Bentley is here, and also Mary Camp, who is with Remax Properties out of Newtown, Pennsylvania. And of course, we have our pet adoption, and we are gonna introduce you uh, to Philly, and he's gonna melt your heart. And that is through the Heart and Home Animal Rescue, and we're excited to, to have you meet them. So today we'll, we're going to get started on our topic. Our first guest is Mary Camp with Remax Properties. She is within the Bucks County, Montgomery County area. And please, Mary, I know that we have talked and you have a great um, philosophy. And you use the Jackie Robinson quote, and this has actually changed your career um, of four years ago, you said? Yes. And it is, a life is not important except for the impact it has on other lives. Can you elaborate on how that particular quote came into your career? Absolutely. Um, well, first I want to say uh, that I am a bit of a baseball fan. So we come from a baseball background. So it just was awesome that Jackie Robinson was the one that said this, this particular quote. But I got into real estate from um, helping a friend. And uh, I was doing different things before I became a full-time realtor. And I was actually supposed to start from being a caregiver for her husband on a particular day. He was battling cancer. And the day that I was supposed to start, he passed away. And so going through that emotion and um, all the change that she had to deal with in her life, um, when the dust kind of settled and she really just wanted to get out of the area and move on to a different state and be with family. I was working part-time with a realtor kind of behind the scenes and I said to my friend, do you want some help with selling the house? I know someone. And she just, before I could even finish it, oh, please, thank God, please, just tell me where to sign and I'm just going to move and just tell me what I have to do. That's it. And so I didn't feel like it came from a salesy kind of aspect. It really was just an honest contribution, an area contribution of my life saying, like, how can I help you? And I know this woman could help you. So what ended up happening is I went to get my real estate license and did it full time. That was my first listing. We sold it at the first open house and she was thrilled. So she just was able to kind of not look back and I took care of it for her. So the only thing she had to do was sign the papers. I kept her up to date on the status of everything, but the relief that she got, and I was able to handle everything for her, I can't put into words how, not really rewarding, because that's not the word I'm looking for, but that I was able to help her go through that horrible phase of her life and help her move on. So I thought, this real estate thing, hey, this is really more about, it's not about sales for me. It's really about helping people. So there's something here. Sounds like you're a natural. And, and they're natural. There's <laughs> another, another baseball, baseball team. <laughs> there we go. All right. So let's talk about marketing your house. Tell me how, what's one of the f most important things a person for selling their home has to do in consideration for mentally preparing to do that? Well, and I'll tell you that this doesn't happen overnight. Um, one of the first things they have to realize is they are selling their home. However, when you are selling it, it is a product. So there's sometimes a lot of, more often than not, a lot of emotion tied up in the things in the home. And also the home is set up to the way, the way that they're living their home. So certain room is set up. I'll be honest, right now, my dining room is my, my home office. Mm -hmm. I, if I were to sell my home, I couldn't sell it like that because people are going to be, where's the living, where's the dining room? They don't understand. So one of the things that a seller has to understand is that we got to turn the page. So what is it uh, going on in their life? What's the next chapter? Are we buying a house? Where are we going? And focus on that. And this is the product that they're selling. So that's one of the big hurdles that I help them overcome. And then we focus on what's next. Okay, so really just focusing on the fact that you're turning your home into a product yes. that you're marketing. Right. So, and one of the first ways that a potential buyer is going to see that is typically online, correct? 
Absolutely. Typically online is, um, in fact, sometimes people will sell the house, see a house online before I even get it in my MLS feed and multiple listing service feed. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they'll, they get information though online and it's not correct or whatever the case is, maybe not for sale, the price is all wrong or whatever. But um, there are times when there are photos and videos and information online that other realtors will list uh, or houses for sale by owner, the, the pictures may not be so wonderful. Maybe they didn't clear, you know, the fog on the screen or the finger is taking up half the picture. Um, there's personal stuff all over the place, crooked, and it's just not professional looking. And so I might equate this, I'm not dating myself, I'm happily married over 10 years, but the online dating world right now. Mm -hmm. Instagram, the, the, the age of digital pictures and video. So the first impression, whether you're dating or whether you're looking for a house, is the picture or video. So if that's the first thing that somebody sees, that first picture, and it's your somebody's finger and it's foggy and everything, then I'll say, what, I don't know what the right word is, swipe word, left or right, <laughs> but see you later, yeah. and they're not going to look any further into that house. So digital presence, those pictures are vital in this, in this day and age. So making sure the house is absolutely ready for those photos when the, you always suggest a professional photographer, obviously, so that you get the best guest marketing pictures, because that's exactly what you want. You want to show it as a marketing aspect. Right. So if somebody contacts me, I want to get, I need to get this house up and we got to list it tomorrow. I'll come in, we'll have a conversation and we'll talk and I'll say, you know, if we took pictures of the house today, you know, and if you saw that house online, you saw these mm -hmm. pictures online, what's, what's the next step? Are you going to come see it or are you passing by? So we kind of understand the importance of the preparation and the presentation of the product. Okay. So um, we need to prepare and have that house really presented in a way for the buyer. Again, touching on the fact that it may not be the way that uh, the person, the owner, is living there. Mm -hmm. So we have to work on the presentation of it in the house of a way that somebody will be looking at it and actually want to take the next step and see it. Because if they see those pictures and you have clutter everywhere and pictures everywhere and in my case, my dining room is my home office. It's confusion. They don't understand. They don't want to go see mm -hmm. it. So they're going to just pass right on by. So I want to go back a little bit. You mentioned video. What, there's pictures and there's video. Right. Where do you see the value in a video of a home? Versus, How does that enhance it online, the, the marketing pa aspect of it? So video. First, I, I do want to clarify a video. Uh, sometimes on Zillow and these other sites, there'll be a, a link for video, and you click on it, and it's the ooh, swi you know swishing pictures in and out, move. and the pictures that move, and yeah. the music. Uh, so that is not a video. So a real, a professional video, and I'll explain why they don't provide the the flow. So the video provides you walk in, the natural flow of the home, you go room to room, and you can more or less sort of do the tour before you actually put your feet on the ground in that house. So it gives you, you know, why waste your time and go see a house if you can tell that it's not the open concept that you want. Mm -hmm. um, you know, paint and everything else is easy enough to overcome with, uh, with buying a house. But the flow is really important and those in and out of the videos or the pictures um, doesn't provide that. It's just a waste of time. And let's be honest, I mean, I have the latest version of the of the iPhone. Mm -hmm. And in this day, everybody has, everybody's photographer, well, photographer. Um, so posting Instagram and everything else, it's way different than having a professional photographer. I could take the pictures and save myself some money, right? I have the iPhone, I could do that. But I don't know the right way, and it's not going to turn out the way when I hire a professional photographer. My clients deserve that. I pay for that. It comes out of my pocket because I know it does, it needs to be done. Okay. So. so in order to get the house ready for that professional photographer, what resources or how do you prepare to declutter the house? Well, uh, the number one resource I have is uh, I actually 
going back to using a professional photographer, I use a professional stager. She's also uh, somebody that is certified in downsizing, organizing. Um, I've seen her own house, and she's very organized in every room and, and drawer in her mm -hmm. own life. So she not only does it for a living, but she lives it. Um, is I bring in um, Maureen Bentley of Get More Organized. And uh, we'll have a consult with my clients. We'll do a walkthrough, mm -hmm. through, you know, around the house. And we'll, I'll take notes. And we're very diplomatic because we do understand we're walking around somebody's home. And, and sometimes people think, you know, this is their museum of stuff. So it could take a little bit of time to go through and hear all the stories. One thing that I've learned is you need to be able to listen because everybody has a story to tell. And I want to listen. So while they're going around and telling me the importance of the things in their life, and I'll take the notes and go back to Maureen, Maureen will make recommendations on things that should be taken down or sometimes, you know, the word uh, decluttering is kind of like, well, my house is not cluttered. And it's not saying mm -hmm. it's cluttered. It's really just a minimalist approach because you're really focusing on the product, which is the house. It's not the furniture and, and, the, and the stuff that's in the house. It's the house. So how, do you, how can you really make the house the focus of the marketing and, and have people want to buy that house? So my number one resource uh, is, is Maureen Bentley. We work really well together uh, to get the client ready and the necessary steps to get the house in ready to be presented for the photography and the video and the marketing. That's perfect because then you have the house, the importance of that home stager coming in, not only preparing for the photos and the video, but you also are now ready for the open house, correct? Right. And what are the benefits of the open house as a marketing tool for you as a realtor? Uh, so the, the open house, sometimes I'll have uh, homes that have a particular feature or two or maybe uh, decor from a different decade, let's say. Um, in this instance, let me use a, a home that I listed a few years ago, and, and I nicknamed it the Purple Palace, and the seller knows that. Um, the house was purple inside, and uh, the seller did, did not have the funds to really do any of those changes. So uh, it was mirrors everywhere, purple splashes and Venetian plaster. Um, I did have a couple of the doors painted white, and I did that because I wanted people to say, this is just paint. I want them to see it's just paint. You can paint it so it's purple. It could be white or any color you want. And I had some quotes from some professional painters because initially uh, people came in, oh, this is going to be $200,000 to repaint the house. And I, I was like, what are you thinking? So I had those quotes available. Um, but the first open house that we did, we dressed in 80s attire. Um, I, I usually do an open house with another uh, person there to kind of cover all the areas. Mm -hmm. We dressed in 80s attire. We had martini glasses with um, munchkins, but we used fancy toothpicks and mirrored plates. And we kind of played off of that um, 80s vibe because it's not, I can't hide it. It mm -hmm. is what it is. But I said, imagine the wedding pictures here. Imagine the prom pictures mm -hmm. here. This is just oozing with glamour. So, you know, I wasn't going to hide it. You can't hide it. But I just really wanted to refocus it and bring it into, well, how could you really play off of these additional um, features that may have been from the 80s in the 2000s? So uh, we got very positive feedback with that and actually ended up selling it to someone who loved the white formica um, little kitchen uh, area to sit, which was made to look like a diner, mm -hmm. and even had the, uh, the jukebox nice. touch. And she, that was the focus point and why she, uh, she ended up <laughs> loving the house. Did she move in and make changes? Sure. But we played around that whole theme and we got everybody relaxed. They didn't come in, oh, you know, oh my God. We just kind of played with it and had fun and used hum humor mm -hmm. in the open houses and talking to people to overcome that fear that it's going to cost a million dollars to change it. So, and Now, on another aspect of the open house that you had mentioned was the benefit of the potential buyer actually being able to come in and talk to you, the listing agent, directly, who has the most information about the house. That's true. Um, so I am there. Uh, and I do my own open houses. So I'm the one that knows the most about the house. 
So it's a little bit better than you go in with your own agent, your buyer, you have your own agent, and it's not that agent's fault, but they don't know all the nooks and crannies and the stories and the additions and all that kind of thing. I write the listing and provide all the information, but there are particular questions it's a lot easier to ask me on the day of the open house. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing I do want to touch on there is um, people may see the uh, realtors with the billboards and the advertisements all over the place, and they'll show up at the listing, and the next time you'll see them is at the closing. And that's not how I operate. I only operate with a number, a handful of clients. So that um, you also may wonder, and you go down on a Sunday and you see a realtors, and there are 10 of them open houses. How does realtor clone themselves? What happened? Mm -hmm. um, no, they have their other agents do it. And that's totally fine. I don't operate that way. So if I'm doing an open house, it's me. And so you get that benefit to ask me, the listing agent, those particular questions. And I'm there. I'm the ones working closest with the seller. And listen, if I don't know the answer, I'm going to write down the question and I'm going to get back to you or your agent. So I, I look at that as a benefit. And then you also have the benefit of you, you are able to give the seller feedback based on all the conversations that you've had. So right. this can mean that if there's a certain point, a common factor or trend that everybody's talking about, you can kind of fix that from a marketing prospect. Right. So if uh, the sellers get a little anxious about ho having open houses, have all these strangers in the house and whatnot. So um, when we have the people come in, I'm writing down the feedback as fast as I can with, you know, what what the people are saying. And a lot of times there's a pattern. So maybe it's, you know, they left the wood paneling in the family room. And again, people are thinking that that's going to cost $10,000 to replace the wood paneling. Or if the sellers were very insistent on a certain price, and everybody that came in said, you know, this would be great. But in a lot of times in the particular markets that I work in, they feel like if the open house went up and it's at a certain price, the seller is not going to negotiate. Because mm -hmm. in this market, a lot of times we're taking full price or more on the offers. So if the theme is that this is a great house, but it's why did you price it? It's not priced right. So then we go back, we have a conversation, and it's data. It's not subjective, it's objective data. Mm -hmm. And then we can have a conversation and see, are there any things we, we want to change or fix? Or let's say it is that paneling. And the next time, you know, I, I might make an adjustment on the, uh, on the listing or at the next open house, I'll be able to say, and just so you know, uh, if you would like to put drywall in the family room, to replace the paneling with, with drywall, it'll be about... $2,000, and I actually have a couple of quotes from local contractors. You're more than welcome to call them. That's fantastic. So you're really using those pre-quotes as a marketing tool to just give more information and education to potential buyers right. while helping the seller. Exactly. Because it's, I don't know, I'm not a contractor, so if I walk in a house and I see purple paint everywhere, oh, $100,000, when yeah. in reality, because it's overwhelming, you just you have no idea, but to ground someone and have a, a couple of quotes and say, go ahead and call them, they're happy to do the work, or if you'd like to have your own contractor come in, that's fine, but then this way, again, you're working with data, it's not subjective information. Mm -hmm. That's great information. So is there anything else, any other tips or advice that you could have for somebody who's going to market their house that you would suggest? Well, um, one thing that will happen when, when you go to market the, the house is everyone means well. So every family member, friend, work, coworker will be giving you advice on what you should be doing. And that's great. Um, you're hiring me, the realtor. This is what I do full time. And we will work, certainly work together. We're a team. And I will listen to everything you have to say. But I will tell you that there are certain things in this industry that work and certain things don't work. So it's my hope that we could work together as a team and you would have that trust in me that I do this full time, that uh, we could do the things that are necessary to market the house because ultimately you want to market it and sell it in the least amount of time possible mm -hmm. and with the less amount, least amount of stress possible. So if we price it wrong and we're sitting on the market or you think, well, why can't we just put it up, you know, bloat it by 20, 30, maybe we'll get it. The problem is if you go and overprice it, it's going to sit. You're going to have to be going through these open houses, and then people think, what's wrong? So let's have that trust and work together. Mm -hmm. um, 
because no matter what I say, you're going to have 10 other people that will tell you they didn't have to do this, they didn't have to stage their home, they left it as is, and they got full price, and that may well, very well be true. But I'm on your side, ultimately, mm -hmm. and I want to sell the house and, and the least amount of time and get you the most uh, dollar amount possible. So. Fantastic. So really the very first step of marketing your home is to find a trusted realtor and using their resources to get the house ready. Understanding that it's not a personal process, but they are doing what they do professionally on a daily basis to bring out the best aspects of your house, to get it sold the fastest and for the most amount of money. Well, one thing I will say, it is a personal process in that the house is full of personal stuff. The house is full of personal memories. I re I'm very respectful of that. So I will sit there and I want you to tell me the stories of it. And then that is in the process of us sort of detaching from the personal and moving on to the next chapter, whatever that may be, and depersonalizing, including that attachment to the house and the thing. So um, for me, it, it's all about the personal relationships with the people and getting to to know them and moving past it to sell that product. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Mary. We appreciate you being here and giving us all this fantastic information. Next up, we have Heart to Heart Animal Rescue, and they're gonna introduce us to Philly, who has already put his paw prints on my heart. Stay tuned. Well, here we are, House to Home Live in our pet adoption segment. Let me introduce you to Julie today. She is with ACT Philly and our returning guest, okay. Sharon, from Heart to Heart Animal Rescue. And I'm going to let Julie introduce Philly here to us and tell us his story. This is Philly. He was brought in April 17th as an owner surrendered. They lost their home. And he has been at the shelter the longest boy in our shelter. He's neutered, microchipped, and fully vaccinated. And he's looking for a good home that he can relax and enjoy long walks. So tell us, Sharon, what's a good fit for Philly as far as is it animals, fenced yard, it seems like he likes yep. to play, things like that. I think a good fit for Philly would be somebody who wants to have a companion that they can go for nice leisurely walks with. Probably a fenced in yard would be good so that he can go out at his leisure oh. and relax and sit in the sun. <laughs> but I think just good walks would be fine for Philly. Um, most likely older children would be best. Um, we don't know how he is with cats, I believe, um, so we don't know what that situation would be. But I just think a nice, quiet home. He is, I'm not saying middle-aged yet, but he is between five and six, so he definitely enjoys his quiet time. Um, he's good with everybody, as you can see, so probably a home that you know maybe isn't crazy busy constantly, but has people that he can greet and play with and enjoy. He loves to give kisses. And um, he is definitely a lap sitter, if he could be. We think he's a little, he thinks he's a little smaller than he is, right? <laughs> and Julie and I were talking about um, just like buying a home is a new phase of your life. We're looking to to get uh, Philly and starting a new phase in his life where he's got nothing but happiness coming and joy and, and lots of love. So, what would be the process of somebody who? seeing Philly and just falling in love with him would go through to actually adopt him? Well, I will let Julie answer that because that is going to be more this time through uh, Act Philadelphia. Sure. If you're interested in adopting Philly, you can go to adopt at actphilly.org and send them an email and they will respond to you right away. If you're interested in adopting any other animal, you can visit ACT's website at www.actphilly.org. Great, great. So um, just talk a little bit more about, about Philly and his activity level. He seems like a very curious boy. He's very lovable, likes his attention. Um, what's, what's his, what's his playtime like? 
I believe he would enjoy taking long leisurely walks <laughs> leisurely. and then Beach, going <laughs> home and making a nice comfy bed out of blankets and falling asleep. Um, I don't think he would be running any marathons. Um, doesn't seem too interested in toys. If you throw a ball, okay. he wonders why you threw it. Okay. So, <laughs> so what are you going to do with that? The walking and the loving are the key points he's looking for, and everybody can give that. Huh? Billy's a low key boy. Yeah. Okay. So let me let's. Um, I know a heart to heart animal rescue and, and Act Philly work together to adopt out and foster many dogs, not just Philly. So please do check out their websites. The information is not only on our screen, but it's also in the description below. They also take donations, of course, because if you can't adopt or foster, um, that is a great thing to do to help these animals and help the organizations because it does take a lot, um, not just food and, and training materials, but the, the time it takes to help them. Um, sometimes it, it requires medical needs too so please consider that look at our description for their links and please consider taking this boy home and giving him a forever home and he will love you forever thank That's you for so sure. much both to Sharon thank and you. Julie for thank being here much. and of course you mr. Philly yeah. <laughs> okay so stay tuned we have Maureen Bentley from get more organized coming up next welcome back and thanks for staying with us at house to home live our next guest today is an expert in home staging and she's also a professional organizer and she's a credit with ASPM. Her name is Maureen Bentley with Get More Organized. Welcome to the show, Maureen. Well, thank you, Cindy. I'm happy to be here. Happy to have you. So let's delve right into, you have a huge passion for what you do. Can you tell us how you got into this and why you love your job so much? Well, uh, I think that I've always had a tendency to be very organized, even as a child. And um, when I started to help my parents do a downsizing in 2007, that's pretty much made the decision for me that this could be a career. And I love the aspect to be able to bring my skills uh, to my clients of today. Yeah, and you do. You, you, I know you help a lot of people because it is such a process. Um, but we are going to really explain, and I'm going to have you do this, of course, what home staging is because so many people think you just need to move a couple pieces of furniture. So please elaborate on the pro the, what it is. Home staging is professionally preparing your home for the market, and there are a lot of different things that come into play with that. Essentially, it is to pare down um, and remove the personal photographs and uh, furniture placement. Uh, it's making sure that it's going to appeal to the maximum amount of potential buyers. And I know this is... Um really gearing towards first impressions of a house, correct? Well, as you know, Cindy, you only get one shot at a first impression. <laughs> so I think it's really important to make sure that uh, you don't rush this process, that you make sure that you've taken care of everything on the list so that you can put your best foot forward when you actually do go on, uh, on the market. And that when you say that, you mean for the photos, of course, because that is the first impression most people have, as we were talking with Mary about. Absolutely. And of course, for the open house as well. It comes down to two things. Presentation, it has to look good to appeal to the buyers, and it needs to be priced right. And then you will have a sale. Yeah. Makes it sound so simple. Well, it's not, <laughs> but I tried, to, I tried to make it simple for my clients. You do. All right, so let's talk a little bit about, because Everybody knows HGTV, and we have so many programs of television out there that talk about home staging and decorating. Can you, we know they are not the same thing, though. Can you tell us what the difference between real life and HGTV is? Well, first what I can tell you is that decorating is done on a personal taste for the um, homeowner. So they choose what they love and want to be surrounded by. Um, 
home staging is very different in the way that the decisions and the choices made are for the buyer. Um, I love HGTV, and it is not as easy as it looks. But what I will say is I really appreciate the fact that it has opened up the eyes um, of sellers to understand the potential and the reasons why staging is so important. Uh, absolutely. So what are some of the benefits? I know, you know, we're not going to talk about pricing because, that, of course, that's going to vary depending on the house and what you're doing. Of course. But what are the, what, give us a little bit about the investment as general and what the benefits of that is. Well, this is the most expensive thing that we own in, in our lives. And so it's really important to make an investment before you go on the market. Uh, for example, if you wanted to sell your um, vehicle, you would make sure that you washed it and waxed it and detailed it. Uh, so the fact that some people think that they can not do that with their home, uh, it's really important to pay attention to the little things. When we live in our house, we often miss the little cracks or uh, the broken this or that. So as a home stager, I'm able to come in and almost be like that first buyer and point out some of the the things that I know that they can um, repair, fix up, and, and essentially just make sure that they are really putting their best foot forward. So that brings us to the process of working with a home stager and what exactly to expect. So you're going to walk through each room of the house and what's the conversation like when you're doing that with a seller? So I try to get the seller to look at it uh, from the eyes of a buyer and, and I help them with each room. If you stand um, at the doorway, what are you seeing? What are you taking in? Um, so there are many steps. I walk them through each and every step. I may give them a list of some of the um, early recommendations. Maybe paint might be one of them, which is a very inexpensive expensive, um, high return um, project that you can take on. So if there's bold colors, we want to neutralize them. Uh, if there's too much furniture in the space, it makes the room look smaller. If it's not light enough, it's not going to um, show the potential of that room. It's about creating emotion. And I walk them through each and every step, uh, often even helping them pack and rearrange the furniture. With the addition of bringing in a few modern pops of color and some um, updated artwork, this all appeals to the buyer and creates emotion so that they can view themselves living there. So it sounds like ultimately you're, you know, you want to stay focused on the fact that you're selling the space not the stuff, of course. That's correct. It's not about um, anything personal. They may have very lovely, beautiful, expensive collections. Um, but if we're trying to attract the younger buyer, a minimalist look is much more effective. So that, that broad appeal, whether it's younger or family, I mean, of course, that's going to depend on the house. But your, your objective is always to get the largest audience possible, correct? Exactly. And that's where those neutral colors come in because it just it's more visual and the imagination of the potential buyer can come in and say, oh, I can see my stuff here. Right, which is why builders still have model homes because we go through them, we see it um, laid out perfectly and we fall in love with it and we say, oh, I can't wait to, this is where I have my coffee and I'm mm -hmm. gonna entertain at this um, area of this large table and it's so light and bright. So um, this is a very effective technique to be able to uh, draw in the most amount of buyers. Okay, so now, the potential seller or the seller has worked with you and you've made this house into the model home and the pictures have been taken, the open house has happened, but now they need to still live there possibly for weeks or even a month or however long it is through the process of selling the home. How do you advise them to do that? Well, uh, I'm not going to kid you. It's a challenge. Uh, but usually, once a lot of the um, extra decor, the many things that are on surfaces, have been packed away, 
my clients usually come back to me and say, I can't believe the feeling that I get when I come home and there's no clutter and there's no paper messes and, and, and a lot of things on the counter. Um, they really start to enjoy the aspect that um, it's uh, a relief and it's easy to maintain. It's easy to clean while you're on the market if you don't have all of these things on your services. And um, many times I find that they want to take that same philosophy to their next house because less is more. And I mm -hmm. would say M-A-U-R. M-A-U-R. <laughs> more time, more space, <laughs> more money for your house when you get it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right, fantastic. So we have... Um, a twofer almost, it sounds like. You have your ability to bring in your organizational skills into the home staging so that that client can really see a organized lifestyle almost a different way than the way they've been living and they like to take that with them. Exactly. I, I love working with um, the 55 and over group because they are downsizing and they may have uh, years and years worth of collectibles and personal possessions. and. Um, I like to think that I can start with them uh, all the way through the process. So I can help them pack, I can help them purge, I can take things to donation, I can help them sell, I can stage the home to present it the best, uh, I can coordinate movers once it's time to, to uh, move out of the house and make that tradition uh, transition. And most importantly, I love the fact when my clients call me back and they say, now, can you help me sort of stage to live in my mm -hmm. new house? And, and that's uh, a real opportunity for me to um, be with these clients for a length of time and really get to know them and, and almost become part of their family. Oh, that's nice. That's where your passion comes. You can Absolutely. just see how much you love it working with the people and, and knowing that you're, you're helping them in so many more ways than just selling their house. Well, many oftentimes people say, I would like to know that this is the way that my parents would be treated mm -hmm. if um, perhaps the, the children live out of state. And so uh, I care for each one of my clients in, in that way. Uh, if their children can't be there, then I want them to feel like they're in good hands. Excellent. Excellent. All right. So we have the, the staged house. They've sold their house. Um, you're going to destage that. That doesn't usually take very long. The, there's Anything else, any other tips or advice that you have for somebody going through this process? I would say that the best tip that you could get would be if you are thinking of downsizing and putting your house on the market, that you should absolutely start early. 12 to 18 months, if that is your thought from now, um, start early, it will be less stressful, it will give you the time to be able to let go uh, of your items and be able to make a smooth transition. So start early. Start early. And I do want to go back one quick result-driven sure. story that you told me with um, back to the investment and really getting that back because you had a story where you said after the open house I had four offers. Exactly. We we worked for um, nearly a month to prepare once the consultation, as I mentioned, and gave them a list of everything that they needed to do, their homework, um, and then was able to come in and really I knew that I was able to show the best parts of this house. And, um, and at the open house, I was so pleased that they got four full price offers. And this is exactly the goal that we all have in mind to be able to um, make this a success story and, um, and really get them the most that they need to be able to retire or downsize to their next home. And that is the ultimate goal. You, you sell it quickly, you have less expenses ultimately, you get more time, you get more space, and you get more money. Yes, um, that is really important because when it looks good, it will spend less time on the market and it will draw in more buyers. You could have multiple offers or you could even go over list. So it, there are so many reasons to make sure that the presentation of your house um, is going to appeal to buyers. It's not about the sellers anymore. Mm -hmm. 
because they've lived in that house. Now it's about helping someone else be able to have a, a long life and new memories in that home. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Maureen. You've given us a ton of information about preparing our home, and I know you're open to taking any questions from our viewers. So please, if you do have a question for Maureen, if you want to enlist in her services, of course, she covers the Bucks County, Montgomery County areas, and she is... Um, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Why, thank She's you. She's wonderful to work with, and she'll get the job done with heart. So please do reach out to her. Her information is on the screen. So next up, we have our golf tip of the day. So stay tuned. Hi, my name's Dalton George, the first pro golf professional here at Five Ponds Golf Club, located in Warminster Township, uh, part of the Spirit Golf Academy. I'm here today to show you the proper technique to get out of a bunker and we are going to highlight a different few shots that you may find yourself in. We're going to go through a, a flat lie, an uphill lie bunker shot, and a downhill bunker shot. Uh, a couple key components that we're going to show you today. Um, first thing is we want to grab ourselves uh, a very lofted club when we are in the bunker. Uh, here today I have my title as Vokey Sand Wedge. Uh, a 58 degree sand wedge here to help us get loft out of the bunker uh, but I want to show you today the proper technique and using the bounce of the golf club um, a lot of a lot of times when we are in a bunker uh, a lot of amateur golfers have a hard time committing to taking a full swing uh, keeping the speed up in the bunker um, and we are actually using the bounce of the golf club to splash the ball out of the bunker and not the leading edge and digging into the bunker. I'm going to go through and show you the proper technique and I'm going to show you a different couple drills that we can take home and come out on your own time and practice. First one here is a flat lie in the bunker. What I want to show you today as a little technique of the splashing method out of the bunker, hinge and splash. We're going to draw, draw a line about an inch behind the golf ball. We're going to draw a line about an inch in front of the golf ball and our goal as we take this swing is to disappear both of the lines and splash this ball out of the bunker keeping the speed of the shot through the through the zone and keeping the speed using the bounce of the golf club Next here, shot number two for you today. We have an uphill bunker shot. First thing I want to do is I need my shoulders to mimic the slope that I'm standing on. So if the slope is angling down, I need my shoulders slightly back. I am taking the same stance as I took on the flat lie. Same technique as before, hinge and splash. I am just working up the slope with this shot. For shot number three today in the bunker, we have a downhill lie. So same opposite as the previous shot. I need my shoulders mimicking the slope. So I need my shoulders aiming down a little bit and I am still trying to hinge and splash, but I need to keep the speed up and keep my finish low to mimic the slope. We do not want to finish high because we will make contact with the equator of the golf ball. We need to finish low to still use the bounce of this golf club. That concludes our bunker lesson today here at Five Ponds Golf Club. Couple wrap up components here. We want to hinge and splash using the bounce of the golf club. And just keep in mind, we need to keep the speed of the swing through the shot. It's kind of hard to tell ourselves that we have to swing full speed when we're only about 10 yards away, but the sand will eat up the club all day long. So we want to keep the speed all the way through the shot. 
And most importantly, you wanna grab yourself a nice sand wedge uh, to help get us out of the bunker, uh, as I have here today with my Titleist Vokey wedge that we have in the golf shop here at Five Ponds Golf Club. Come see us here to get a lesson if you need help getting out of the bunker.